Good morning. Welcome to uh, Grace Baptist Church and our 2020 Men's Heart Conference. And uh, we're so glad that you can join us. And uh, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be able to meet together. We're going to be having uh, three speakers today. Uh, our first speaker will be Pastor Tim Guerin. Uh, he's going to be speaking on the godly man's character. And then we're going to have a 10 minute break and uh, sh uh, just show a short uh, uh, screen for you to be able to take a break for 10 minutes and listen to some good music. And then after that 10 minute break, we're going to have our second session with Pastor Ryan King, uh, the godly man's heart. And uh, then we're going to have another 10 minute break. And then after that, we're going to have our final session and we'll be looking at the godly man's home. And so it's a privilege to have with us today, uh, Pastor Tim Guerin. Uh, him and his wife, Marge, have been serving in uh, Nova Scotia for uh, around 23 years at the Lockport Independent Baptist Church. And uh, we're just so thankful that God has used him. We appreciate his friendship. God has used him and uh, also starting the South Shore Baptist Church in Liverpool. And uh, we're so thankful for his friendship and his ministry, his love for the Lord. He's worked with youth and boys' homes and camps and uh, church planting for years. And we're just so thankful for his friendship. And Pastor Garen's going to bring the word of God. I hope you have your Bibles and a pen and a piece of paper to be able to take notes. Uh, as we focus as men on what God has for us in the midst of this pandemic and when it's over, what is God's plan for us? So you listen to Pastor Garen as he shares the word of God with us. Well, good morning. It's a joy to be able to be with you today and uh, so thankful for Grace Baptist Church and Pastor Cochran as we come and talk about being a man, knowing what God has for each one of us. I trust this will be a special time. I trust this will be a time that we can look unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. I trust you knowing. I trust that you desire to be the man of God that he would have you to be. As we begin turning your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we want to look at one verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to see what God has to say, or Paul has to say to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says in verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I don't know about you, but I like the old West. I like to read about the good guys and the bad guys. There's a, a author named um, Louis L'Amour, and he had many phrases, uh, and I'm going to mention about five of them. One of them is, have faith in God, but keep your powder dry. That talks to me about always being ready, always being ready. He also said this, victory is won not in miles, but in inches. Do we have endurance? Do we have endurance? And then there's a funny one that is one of his writings, he said this, there is nothing more dangerous than a woman with a shotgun because you don't know when it's going to go off and neither does she. That tells me, expect the unexpected. Listen, as a being a man, there's many things in our life that's unexpected. We need to expect the unexpected. And then he also said this in one of his books called The Walking Grump said a ship does not sail with yesterday's wind. We don't look to the past. We need to press on. He also says this. He said the mind is a basket. If you put nothing in, you get nothing out. And do we have a hunger to learn? So that's what the world has to say about men. What does God have to say? I want to look at six qualities of manhood. Six qualities of manhood. Notice it also says in Ephesians 6 verse 10, finally my brethren be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his mind. If we're going to be men of God, we're going to have to do it and be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. The first quality is follow after righteousness. Follow after righteousness. Listen, if we're going to do that, we've got to be strong in the Lord. We've got to be in the power of his might, righteousness. Are we cultivating a relationship with God? Are we cultivating that relationship? Listen, the more you love God, dear friend, the more you love God, the greater your desire it will be to please him. Enoch was such a man. Enoch was a man that he had this testimony that he pleased God. Listen, righteousness is something that we do. It's something that God says, cultivate a right relationship with me and you'll be right. Do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? Listen, that psalmist said that we are to hunger and thirst. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Listen, do we hunger to do that which is right? Do we please God in everything that we say and everything that we do? Listen, a godly man will do right no matter what the cost. A godly man will do right no matter what the cost. I think of that uh, Daniel. Daniel was a man that he did right regardless of the cost. He said, I can't eat that meat. That meat will defile myself. I want to do right. And the king said, why don't you bow down to me? He said, I can't bow. I can't bow down. He said, I'm not going to pray to anybody but my God. And he ended up in a den of lions. And you know what? God saved him. He was a man that did the right. Listen, if we're going to be a man of God, we're going to have to do that which is right. Paul said, but thou, O man of God, follow after we're going to follow after. Listen, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and do right. But secondly, he talks about following after godliness. Following after godliness. Do we have a heart for God? Do we learn to love God even more? Do we have that precious relationship? Listen, we need to do right, and that's great. I know some people that can just do right, do right, but they have a wrong attitude. Listen, God said, I want you to be godly. Godliness is from the inside out. In fact, he said, a personal relationship, a personal worship time. I love this old psalm, Psalm 42, 1. It says, as the heart panteth after water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I don't know if you many hunters out there but there's nothing more exciting than to see that big buck come out of, of, the, of the blind there and you see him standing there. But do we hunger and thirst after God? Do we really get a hold of that personal time of worship? You know, we can tell God all our troubles and trials, and yes, that's, that's what God wants, but he wants to know that we love him. We worship him. He is the God of heaven. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, how we need to have that personal time of worship. Do you get alone with God every day? Do you have a time where you just get alone and tell God how great he is and how wonderful he is? Do we have that personal time of worship? We miss worship today as we can't get together like we used to. And I hope that day comes quickly. But you know, as we gather together through these means, do we really worship God? Do we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Listen, dear friend, or we have personal dedication to holiness. What is within you? Do you desire to be holy? In fact, in Leviticus 27, it says this, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord, your God. Be holy. Why? Because God is our God. I trust you know him. I trust you have a personal relationship with him. And it will draw closer to him in these days in which we live. Do we have to follow after godliness? 
Listen, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You will not be godly unless you do it in the power of his might. Have a heart to know God. Listen, we need to strengthen the inner man. If we're going to be godly men, true men of God, true men that take a stand, we're going to have to feed upon the word of God. Study to show thyself a proven unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, dear friend, are you feeding on the word of God? Do you as men take the word of God and share it with your family? Listen, you need to be a leader. Men, if you're godly, you're going to have a love and a compassion for the word of God. And we need to feed upon that word of God. Feed on the fellowship with God. It's one thing to love the word of God, memorize the word of God, and dig into the word of God. But it's another thing to feed upon the fellowship with God. Ain't it walk with God? They talked to one another. He prayed. He meditated. He rejoiced in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Dear friend, are we feeding with the fellowship with God? Yes, it's fun to have fellowship with other believers. Man, that's important. We need to get together. We need to fellowship one with another. And we can build one another up. But when we're talking about godliness, we need to have fellowship with our God. Imagine Adam as he walked in the garden with God. And they walked and they talked perfect environment and yet he realized that he needed that relationship so listen we need to follow after righteousness we need to follow after godliness and then thirdly we need to follow after faith listen be strong in the lord and in the power of his might we cannot do that without faith faith is trusting in god just a trust. Do we have confidence in God? Do we have faith in God? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Listen, dear friend, do we have faith? Do we have confidence in our God? Romans 1.17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Listen, do you believe God? Do you walk by faith? Listen, if you're going to be a leader, you got to walk by faith. You've got to be individuals that will simply believe God. Listen, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Walk by faith. You look at all the Old Testament heroes of faith. You think of Moses as he walked by faith. Can you imagine as he stood before Pharaoh and he says, let my people go? And Pharaoh said, what are you going to do? And he said, stand still and see the salvation of God. And folks, we need to walk by faith. We need to be men of faith. Joshua followed God by faith. He looked at all of Jericho and he looked at those walls. And he says, how am I going to do this? He said, I'm just going to believe God. I'm going to walk around the city and God's going to give us the victory. Do we have faith in God? Faith. Faith in God. Be a leader. Be a man of God. Oh, thou man of God. Walk in faith. And then fourthly, follow after love. Follow after love. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Oh, how men need to show love. Learn to have compassion for people. Jude says having some, having compassion, making a difference. Do we have compassion on a lost and dying world? Do we have compassion one for another? Do we see those in need and have a compassion for them? Do we look and see what God is doing? Do we really learn to care for people? Are we a servant? Do we have a servant's heart? Do we see what God wants us to do. In, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. 
Be pitiful. Be courteous. Love one another. Love his brethren. I have a twin brother. And uh, boy, we used to fight like cats and dogs. But you know, if anybody else has tried to beat up on one of us, boy, we'd both jump in. We'd defend one another. You know, we, we would fight the good fight, so to speak. But listen, dear friend, we need to love. We need to love people. You know, as we had this horrible massacre, and we see the evil that is out there. Listen, do we need to learn to love people more? When people are hurting, do we love them? When people are going through grieving processes, do we love them? Listen, what about those that are out of work? They don't know where the next paycheck is coming from. Listen, do we as men have compassion and love? By the way, show that. If you can help, help. If you can be uh, one that comes alongside of, you need to be a helper. God said, follow after. Paul said to Timothy, follow after faith. Follow after righteousness. Follow after godliness. Follow after love. Love. Of course, Jesus gave that great example. He loved us so much that he died for us. That he shed his only, uh, shed his blood for us. He rose again that we might have eternal life. Listen, Jesus says, follow after love. And then fifthly, it says, follow after patience. Follow after patience. Listen, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Listen, follow after patience. What does patience mean? That word patience actually means to bear up under to bear up under. Listen, godly men will endure. They'll endure. It says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, they'll therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Listen, if we're going to be men of God, if we're going to be men, we've got to have patience. Listen, we've got to endure to the end. Listen, godly men will be faithful. They will endure in fact, in James 5, 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Listen, real men can be counted on. I know y'all have been going through that study in Job. And that Job was a man that endured. But listen, we need to be counted on. Hey, can you be counted on? If God asked you to do something, would you do it? Would you be men that are counted on to not only be faithful, but men that will endure? Even in the hardest of times, are you going to be faithful to God? Listen, when everything falls apart, are you faithful? Listen, are you individuals that are patient? Listen, godly men will focus on the finish line, there was a fellow that was in the uh, Olympics, and uh, he was a runner, and boy, he was fast, and they thought he's going to win, he's going to win it all, and boy, he was down to his last race, and it was like the 400 meter, and boy, he was getting ready, and he got down to them blocks, the gun went off, boom, and boy, he took off like lightning, and about halfway, his uh, leg and uh, hamstring must have tore. And then he fell to the ground in excruciating pain. And uh, the nurses and everybody went over to him and he, he fought to get back up. He said, you can't get up. He said, I got to finish. I got to finish. He said, I came all this way. I've got to finish. And boy, he started hobbling to the finish line. And over 40,000 people stood up and started cheering him. And in the crowd was his father. And his father busted through the security and came down on the track and uh, said, son, you don't have to finish. He said, son, you're hurt. He said, dad, I've got to finish my course. I've got to finish the race. And his dad took his son and in his arms and they both crossed the finish line. Why? Because he had a desire to finish well. Godly men are going to have to learn to finish well. Dear friend, do you have the patience that God wants you to have? 
Do you have a godly man with focus on the finish line? The Apostle Paul did. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, it says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Listen, dear friend, godly man finish well. And we need to finish well. Listen, uh, make sure that you, 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 the God that gives us power, listen, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Endure. Don't quit. And then we come down to the last one. Follow after meekness. Follow after meekness. Humility. But it's more than just humility. One man has said it is strength under control. Listen, a godly man will have strength under control. In Ephesians 4, 2, it says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Listen, do we have strength under control? Do we have a humility that realizing that God's in control? Be strong in the Lord in the power of his mind. You see, it's nothing we do. It's all that God does through us. We're just vessels in the master's hand. Oh, dear friend, do we come be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Listen, a godly man has a humbleness of spirit. A humbleness of spirit. He doesn't have to slap himself on the back. He doesn't have to get uh, accolades from everybody else. He's doing it for the Lord. He loves the Lord. He wants to serve the Lord. Listen, real men are secure in Christ. In Titus 3, 2, it says to speak evil of no man and be not a brawler, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Real men are secure in Christ. Moses was a man. Moses was one of the meekest men that ever lived. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man that was humble. We have a humbleness of spirit. We follow after that. We be humble. Listen, we need to follow those things. These six areas, these six areas, follow after righteousness. Follow after godliness. Follow after faith. Follow after love. Follow after patience. Follow after meekness. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Conclusion, I want to look at that 12th verse, though. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. It says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Listen, we need to see godly men. Listen, a man will fight the good fight of faith. They'll go God's way. A godly man will lay hold on eternal life. Because the finish line, really, when we get to heaven, when Jesus looks at you and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Listen, or godly man will lay hold on eternal life. Listen, we have the greatest news in all the world. Listen, folks, we need to proclaim the greatness and goodness of our God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Listen, be a man. God's called us to be. Listen, God has called you to be a man. Don't be childish. Put away those things. Start standing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Be a man. It's your choice. So these are 12 qualities of manhood. I pray that each one of us will look deep into our hearts and that we'll say, God, make me a man. I want to be that man. I want to stand true. You look at all the men in the past that have done great things for God. Why? Because they were men. They were godly men. Listen, you may not do great and wonderful things for God, but if you touch one life with Jesus Christ, and you get to go and you see what God can do 
in a man's life. He can change the world upside down. He took 12 men. They turned the world upside down. Oh, that we might be that man. He's a little Sunday school teacher, and he just taught his little boys. And boy, he was faithful in teaching those boys. And he thought, well, what am I done for Jesus Christ? Well, later on, one of those boys grew up, and he led thousands to the Lord Jesus Christ. That one little man was D.L. Moody. Listen, we never know who will influence for the Lord Jesus Christ. All I can say, men, is be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. May God bless you and may God use you as godly men. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do love thee. Lord, we thank thee that thou art a great and mighty God. We thank thee that we can be strong in thee because you are strong. And we can be powerful because you are powerful. And Lord, we can have these qualities of manhood because you told us to follow after these things. And Lord, I pray that we'd fight the good fight of faith, that we'd lay hold on eternal life. And Lord, that we would be a good example to all that see us because thou art worthy. Bless and use us in all that we say, in all that we do. Bless this conference in a mighty way. And Lord, may we see men that are sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Garen, for sharing those, those words of the godly man's character. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to uh, have Pastor Ryan King is going to share from us of the godly man's heart. So you take the next 10 minutes, and please be back with your Bibles in your place. Thank you. Well, it's been a blessing to be able to study God's Word today on this Saturday in the springtime. The sun is shining here in the Maritimes, and we're so so thankful to be able to study God's Word together. Um, we're, it's a privilege to have Pastor Ryan King. He's been a friend of mine. He's been serving at the Bethel Baptist Church in Westville, Nova Scotia for the past 15 years. And uh, before that, he was he served as a youth pastor. He's from uh, British Columbia and uh, born in Calgary. But we're th I'm thankful for his friendship. And his wife, Jacinda, have been a blessing to uh, my wife and my family and I and our church here. Our assistant pastor, Pastor Jacob Baldwin, served as his assistant for some time. But we're so grateful for uh, the opportunity to study God's Word today. And you take your Bibles and your pen and a piece of paper and be ready to take notes as he shares with us about the godly man's heart. Thank you, Pastor King. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Pastor Cochran, and thank you, Grace Baptist Church, for putting on this men's conference. Serving men of God is what we need in the time for our families and for our churches. Uh, I'd like you to turn your Bibles with, Bibles with me to the book of James, chapter 4. And for the next few moments this morning, I want to talk about the heart of the godly man. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into it together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the truths of the Bible. Would you work now in our lives in a special way to show us truth for your glory in the name of Christ. Amen. There was a thing on Facebook that went around the other day to take a look at all the different cars that you own and put them up on a slide so everybody can see it. It's just a walk through memory lane. When I did that, I was reminded of the second car that I bought when I was 17 years old. It was a 1989 Plymouth Horizon hatchback, white. The counterpart would be the Dodge Omni. Some of you remember that bad boys and cruised down the highways. <coughs> that was the car that I had for most of my high school years. It's the car that I drove 3,000 miles from Southern British Columbia down to go to Bible College in Indiana. And it's the car that I had for most of my freshman year. One particular day, 
my friend Richard and I, we were driving down to Martinsville, Indiana, and we were gonna pick up my wife-to-be, my wife, wasn't my girlfriend at that point, but she was gonna play piano and we were helping the church plant. And on the, the way down, my car all of a sudden, that old 89 Plymouth Horizon, on the dashboard, the gauge for the temperature began to rise steadily. Now, I'm not a mechanic anyway. I get frustrated and confused when it comes to the cars and fixing cars. But my friend Richard is a backyard mechanic, and he is the one that I would rely on to help get things fixed in that old car. So we're driving down the road, and the temperature gauge begins to, to go up and up, and now we're almost red, and I'm beginning to get nervous. And I say, Rich, we're in the red. What do we do? And Richard said, don't worry about it. He said, sometimes when that's happening, you can counteract it by turning on the heat. And so it's 95 degrees outside, and like a bunch of yo-hos, we got the heat on the car on full blast trying to counteract this. And apparently that method does work if you have coolant in your radiator. Unbeknownst to me that my radiator had sprung a leak, and we were driving on an empty radiator with the heat blasting, and before much longer, that temperature gauge went all the way to the red, and we heard a loud bang and smoke, and I blew my engine. I loved that 1989 Plymouth Horizon. Just like the warning lights on my dash were an indicator that something is amiss underneath the hood. God gives us warning lights as men to show us when something is not right under the hood. And the warning lights that God gives us are our emotions. One of the things that a godly man will know and understand is how to use the alarm system that God has rigged, that God has set up inside of us to aid us in our worship of him. Man, let me ask you a question. Do you become easily depressed and despondent when things don't go your way? Now, we're adults. We're not supposed to throw fits like little kids, but we can when things don't go our way. Do you explode and yell with anger? Are there times when your wife and your children have to come in, yet they're walking like eggshells around you so not to upset dad? Do we sulk? Do I get easily irritated? Do I overreact about things? See, God gives us emotions, specifically in the way when we overreact with those, to show us that something is wrong inside, that something is out of whack with my heart. Let me give you an illustration that several years ago, when we bought the house we live in now, it's a bungalow in the basement. And we had some girls that we babysat, and one of them had gone to the bathroom upstairs and had flushed the toilet and had clogged the toilet and had kept flushing the toilet, so much so that the flusher got stuck. So now the toilet is running, and it's running on and on so that it overflows the toilet. It's now running on the floor, it's running so much on the floor, it's running down the hallway. We didn't know any of this until it began to cool and pour down the stairs and down the radiator until we had a drop ceiling in the basement with hard wired alarm, smoke alarm system all through the house. And now we have this pee water pooling down the hallway, down the stairs, pouring into the drop ceiling, and it shorted out all of the smoke detectors. When it shorted them out, every smoke detector in the house went off at the same time. So I want you to picture this in your mind. We have a flood, and not any flood, a yellow flood. And not any yellow flood, a yellow flood with that annoying smoke detector sound, meh, 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 that will not stop, and everyone is going off at the same time. So now I, and trying to clean it up. And how do you clean up a flood? You grab towels. You grab every available towel in the house. So I got towels on the stairs, and I got towels on the floor, and I'm trying to clean up. And as I'm cleaning things up, there is a steady drip of yellow water 
on my head, down my shirt, soaking me. I wasn't in a good mood. I ran out of towels. I needed more towels. And so I asked my then 11 year old oldest son to go get me more towels. Now he had some free time in the moment, so he was sitting on the couch. And I will show you the exact speed on which he got up off that couch to go get me more towels. The speed was like this. And I'm not exaggerating. This is real time. He got up. He began to walk about this fast to go get me more towels. And at that moment, I may have said something like this. Move faster! Now, was it right for him to move at the speed of sludge to give me more towels? Absolutely not. Was it right for me to lose my temper, to raise my voice in such a tone that shook the house, to yell at him to get a move on? Was that correct? It was not. What was happening? That my emotions were showing me in my overreaction that something was wrong inside. We know the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, in our passage in James chapter 4, we see several things that a godly man can know. First of all, know this, that a godly man knows that my own heart is the problem. In verse number 4, or verse number, chapter 4, verse 1, he asks us a question. He says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? And so James asks us the question, he says, where does all the fussing come from? Why do we fight? Why do we yell at our kids? Why do we get irritated with our wife? Why do we stomp around when we're mad at the neighbors or our bosses? Why do we do these things? Where does the fighting and the fussing come from? And the answer that James gives us is disturbing. I don't like it. He said, it comes from you. Or he comes from me. But my problems arise not from my circumstances, not from my kids, not from my job, not from my brain, but from me. It's so easy for you and I to get into a blame shifting mode and lay blame at the feet of others. We would say stuff like, well, if my kids would behave better, then I wouldn't get mad so much. And if my wife was more respectful, then I wouldn't speak to her with impatience. And if my job, if my boss wasn't such a bonehead, then I would do better at work. If we look at all the reasons we're not doing things and all the reasons we sin, and we say, if they were different, then I wouldn't be so angry. If they were different, I wouldn't be so cutting and sarcastic. If they were different, we lay the blame on them. But James said that's not true. James said it's not their fault you're this way. It's your fault you're this way. It's my fault on how I respond. Now, the key word here in verse number one is the word lusts. He says the wars and the fightings and the fussing, they come from the lusts that are war in your members. Now, the word lust doesn't always have to mean sexual lust, although it can. What it does mean is a strong desire that I want something. And this something that I want doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a bad thing, but it can be a good thing. It's just something that I want, I want it now, I want it badly. And these desires, these lusts, they play out in my body. They play out in my members. In other words, there's a war going on inside of me. Now, for example, just as the sun facilitates growth in plants, trials, circumstances, pea water dripping from the ceilings, they bring out what's inside my heart, and they can be seen by my responses. So these desires, these lusts that I have, they become a problem because I want them more than I want God. So understand this. Here's a phrase that has helped me. I do 
what I do because I want what I want. Verse 2 continues on our thought here. He says, you lust, you have not, you kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain, you fight in war, and you have not, because you ask not. Now, Jesus reminded us that it is my heart which is the source of my problems. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 18 and 19, he said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and blasphemies. So all these things that Jesus talked about, all these desires, all these sins, all these locks from my heart, they come and shape my thinking, my speaking, and my acting, both in a righteous way and a sinful way. Now what happens is that when I want this, whatever it is, this lust, when it becomes a misdirected desire, when I want it more than I want to honor God, it becomes an idol. So let me give you an example of how we can identify these hard items. Do I want something so bad that I'm willing to sin in order to get it, or do I respond in sin when I don't get what I want? For example, one of the things about a man is that sin tends to be important to us, how God made us, is that there is a certain level of acceptance that I want. It's important for me to be accepted. I want to be liked by people. I want, I like it when people say nice things. I want my community to like me. I want my church to like me. But I'll tell you what, there's one person in the world that I want acceptance more than any other person on this planet. That's my wife. It's important to me. Have you ever noticed that oftentimes that when there's a fight with our wife or that there's a, a disagreement with our wife, that when I feel that she's mad at me, Maybe I deserve it, maybe I don't deserve it, and I feel that I don't have her acceptance. I can send at least me into a tailspin. I can become very irritable with my kids. I can become impatient with my church members, all because that I feel as if my wife's upset at me. Now, is it wrong to want my wife's acceptance? Absolutely not. But if I want it so bad that I don't get it, and I'm now responding sinfully, I want her acceptance more than I want to honor God, and that becomes idolatry. By the way, men, let me give you a warning. One of the great times of temptation for those involved in pornography or after a fight with your wife is then a temptation comes, the one that will upset you, one that is not upset. It's a great temptation. What about another example? I tend to be pretty even keel. I, I tend not to get too high or too low. Uh, I'm pretty even. But there's one thing that will set me from zero to 60 faster than anything else. And that is my two teenage boys. And one maybe a bit more than the other. That if I feel that I'm being disrespected, if I feel that there is some sass in that, boy, I can get hot. I can get hot quick. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is it wrong for me as a father to want my teenage son sons to respect me? Is that sin? No, of course not. It's absolutely not sin. But if I want that respect from them more than I want to honor Jesus Christ, and I don't get it, and then I get mad and overreact, and I yell, or I'm unnecessarily stern and irritated, what have I just done? I wanted something that they were going to give me more than I wanted out of Christ. I didn't get what I wanted, so I sinned. What about this? We, even when we're at work all week, and we come home, or all day we come home, and we're exhausted, and we're tired. And all you want to do is sit down for five minutes and veg. But especially if your kids are little, and you come home, and your wife has been trying to make dinner and deal with children, and deal with this, that, and the other. 
And the moment you come in the house, she hands you a five pound baby with a 10 pound diaper that says, take care of this thing for me. Or you're finally get the chance to sit in your chair and your four year old comes up and he's going, dad, 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 dad. And finally you say, what? What's happening here? That the desire of my heart was comfort. I just wanted to sit for five minutes. Is it wrong to want to relax? Is it wrong to want comfort? Is it wrong to sit? No, it's not. But if I want those things more than I want to honor Jesus Christ, I respond sinfully to when my wife interrupts my comfort, when my kids interrupt my comfort, that overreaction of my emotions. It's God's way of saying, there's something wrong inside. There's something wrong with your heart. You know, I've become an idolater. These things may not be wrong with themselves, but they become wrong when I want them more than I want to honor my God. In verse 3, he says, You lust and receive not, because you ask amiss that you may consume them upon your lusts. This is also the reason, by the way, God will not answer our prayers. Because God loves us and he wants us to have him at our center. And God will not give us anything that feeds this lustful idolatry. How many times when we were, our kids were little, real little, and they were having one of those nights where they just were not sleeping. They cried all night. My second child had acid reflux, and he was one of the ones who cried all night. And I remember just saying, Lord, please help this kid sleep. Somehow make him sleep. Now, is having our desire to have my screaming child pass out, is that simple? <laughs> no, it's not simple for one of them to sleep. But if I don't get what I want because he keeps crying, and then I act sinfully and snap at my wife, I become this director. God will not answer that. And I become an idolater, worshiping something other than God. So a godly man knows. God has placed my heart and my emotions as an indicator of my worship to him. But then number two, a godly man knows that when I'm in a place of idolatry, this is a dangerous place to be. When my kids were, oh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago, we had gone down to Washington, D.C. for a day on the way down south to visit things. And so we had gone to the museums and saw the statues and the memorials and all those things. But I had read that outside the downtown D.C., where all the tourists go, you don't get very many streets over before it gets pretty dangerous pretty quick. And so we had finished up at the Lincoln Memorial, and now we're trying to head back to where our, the subway's going to be. And I'm the hick. I do not do subways. When I first got on the subway, I looked at it like a monkey at a math problem. Could not figure it out. Had to have someone help me. Uh, just the whole thing confuses me. And so we're headed back to the subway. I'm all confused. I'm all nervous, and now it's getting dark. And the way I look at my map is to get back to the subway, we have to walk it straight over, so we're outside the main tourist area. And I'm beginning to panic a little bit because it's getting, getting dark. I find myself not in the tourist area, but in the murder capital of the world, where there's people around every corner waiting to prey upon me, and I begin to panic. At that moment, as we're walking very swiftly to get to the subway station in time, Jacob, who happens to get nosebleeds, had the most inopportune nosebleed of all time. But we couldn't stop. We're going to miss our train. We missed our train. We're all going to get murdered. So we have to get out of this dangerous place right now. So I, this is the picture here. My wife is carrying, or she's pushing the stroller. I have one hand with Nathaniel. One hand with Jacob, with he has a bloody um, Kleenex smooshed on his face, blood's dripping out of his face, blood's on his shirt, but we cannot stop because we're going to get murdered. We get to the subway station, I haul Nathaniel on one shoulder, I haul Jacob on the other shoulder, Jacinda has to lift the stroller, we're running up the stairs to get out of this dangerous spot before we all die. Maybe I panicked just a little bit. But a godly man knows that we're in a dangerous position. We've got to get out of there with all haste. 
And when we're in a place of idolatry, it's a dangerous spot, and a godly man knows that this is not a place where we want to stay. Notice the very strong terminology that James uses about our idolatry. In verse 4, he says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God? Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, and give grace to the humble. Notice he calls it adultery here. This is a big charge. When I became converted, I entered into a covenant relationship with my Creator. And yet, when I put something above the Lord, I become unfaithful to Him. In the letter to the church of Ephesus, in Revelation chapter number two, John charges the church of leaving their first love. So when I am putting something above God, no matter what it is, whether it's my comfort, whether it's my desires, whether it's my, my desire for acceptance, whether it's my kids or my wife, anything, no matter whether it's good or bad, that goes above Christ, I then become guilty of spiritual adultery. And that's a serious charge. James then calls it friendship with the world. That I would then love things more than I love God. Now the world is the world system. Popular culture that surrounds us. Now the things of the world at best are indifferent to the things of God. At worst they're hostile to the things of God. Then why in the world would I as a blood-bought Christian choose the worldly things around us over the one that saved me and loved me and changed me? And notice as James puts it here, he said it's an enmity. If I love the world system that, that hates the Lord Jesus Christ, more than I love God, I have sided effectively with the enemy. <laughs> I have given myself an alliance with that that hates God. I have sided with the wrong team. I have chosen to side with the group that actively hates Christ. James also calls it proud in this. Now, this again goes back to the heart of the matter, isn't it? Where I want what I want. I'm going to get it now. You're not going to stand in my way. And if you do, I'm going to manipulate it. I'm going to throw a fit or I'm going to yell. I'm going to raise my voice. One of the things we do in counseling is we have people journal. That, for example, there's an anger issue going on. That I have to write down the time that I become angry, what happened when I became angry, uh, what caused the anger. And then something else I always want to write or have them write is what was I trying to accomplish by my reaction? So if I am now yelling, in my example, P water, what was I trying to accomplish by my yelling? Have my son move faster. Now, did that accomplish him moving faster? It did for the short term, but it caused longer term issues because then I then had an issue between my son and I and the way I responded. What was I trying to accomplish? See, all this goes back again to this idea of pride that I want what I want. I want to exalt the kingdom of Ryan rather than the kingdom of God. I do what I do because I want what I want. And all of these things separate me from my God. Now, thirdly, a godly man knows the danger, will repent and seek after God. See, God <clears throat> made us creation as worshiping beings. It's, that's simply true. We will either worship God or we will worship something else, namely ourselves. Our heart's desire ought to be to delight in the Lord, to glorify the Lord, to please the Lord, to love the Lord. And when I do so, when that's my heart's desire, then my trials and my circumstances, when they come against me, my response will be honoring to God. I can then, when I'm irritable, still speak in love to my life. 
When things are going my way, I can still be in kindness to my children. I won't snap. I won't be irritated with people of my church. Why? Because even though things are happening, I have my heart desire that no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, my honor, my desire must be in Christ. I will honor him above all. I will glorify him above all. Now, but if I worship myself, my response will be sin. I did not get what I want, so I respond and sin. Again, this is where the whole reaction is really helpful to know where our heart's desires are. So this life that I live is not about my desires, it's about Christ. And he outlines the solution for us when we find ourselves in idolatry. Verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We recognize that our satanic pride is at the root, and that I must submit myself. That is not about me. It's not about my desires. It's about honoring Jesus Christ. He goes first. What he wants goes first. Once again, we get, I do what I do because I want what I want. If I want to honor myself, I respond simply. If I want to honor Jesus Christ, I respond righteously. One of the characteristics of a godly man that Pastor Gary gave us just a few minutes ago. Verse 8, draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Draw nigh as the idea of coming near to listen or to hear. The idea that in my life is a man who needs to raise my children in a godly way, and to minister to my wife in a godly way, and to minister to my church in a godly way, that I do not have the answer in and of myself. That I need wisdom from outside me. That I need to humble myself. That I need to draw near to God and beg Him for things. That as long as I think I can do it on my own, I will not draw nigh. And it's the heart of the selfish matter. If I think that I can do this by myself, if my issues are not that bad, my goals aren't that bad, I will not come to the Lord in repentance and seek his help. This happens through his word. This is an understanding, by the way, that doing things my way is slowly destroying my family. Dads, men, do you like it when things are tense and angry around your house? I hope not. Do you like it when your kids have to walk on eggshells around you because you're irritable? I hope not. All these have long-term consequences. See, what we need to do in our repentance is look through our actions and our desires through the lens of God's Word. See what God has to say about it. And this is where repentance comes in. Once God's perspective is believed, then repentance happens. That I agree with the Lord, I confess from my sins, and I turn from my sin to Christ. And then appropriate action and worship can take place. Look at verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn. And weep. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Repentance is a serious business. So when we recognize our idolatry before the God of creation has saved us, loved us. When we do this, we will be mournful of our sin. We will come to God on God's terms. And this is in great contrast with the sorrow of the world. 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us, For God in sorrow worketh for repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, this entire process is about admitting that my ways are wrong or God's ways are right. By the way, this is the essence of addiction in all its forms. Believing that my desires, whatever they are, good or bad, will satisfy me, but they will not. So, friends, when I overreact, it is my clue that God gives me, that I am worshiping something other than Christ. 
few years ago, we went down for a couple of days down by Digby to a little island off the coast of Nova Scotia called Briar Island. And on there was a little village called Westport. And there is a, a cairn or a memorial to a guy by the name of Joshua Slocum, who was from Westport, Nova Scotia. And he sailed around the world. I thought that was fascinating. So I went home, I looked him up, and I bought his book. And he had made, he had written a, one of the first adventure books of his, his experience of, in a, as a solo sailor sailing around the world from Boston Harbor in 1896. It was a fascinating book from a first person perspective. Well, one of the things that was interesting is him talking about the times when his water ran low and being in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean, hundreds of miles from any other land, and having water run low, becoming so thirsty, and being surrounded by water, but knowing that if you drink, that salt water would destroy you. You would think it's fulfilling, but it's actually killing you. This is the same thing that our misdirected lusts are doing. You think they're fulfilling us, my comfort, my desire for respect, whatever it is, I think that's fulfilling me. But if I want that more than I want Christ, it's destroying me and killing me. Men, what are we overreacting about? What do we get so upset about? What do I want more that I want to honor Christ? The godly man knows that God has given us such a wonderful and easy indicator of my heart. Those are my emotions. And something is wrong underneath the hood. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for Jesus. Show us these truths. Thank you for this conference for men. Help us be godly men for our families and our churches. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor God. Thank you, Pastor King, for sharing that blessing from the Word of God and uh, looking at a godly man's heart. And uh, it's, uh, it's very humbling as a man to be able to uh, look in the scriptures and look in the mirror and, and look inside of us uh, through God's x-rays of the scriptures. Uh, like one author said, it's like uh, have an open heart surgery before the Lord and you can trust him. And uh, appreciate Pastor King sharing that from the word of God. And uh, I hope that you're taking some notes and some noting some of these things. So that's a blessing. We're going to take a 10 minute break and, uh, and then we're going to have our last session. So uh, stretch your legs, but please be back and bring your Bibles and we'll have our last session. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today for our men's heart conference in 2020 here at the Grace Baptist Church. It uh, definitely has been a blessing to be able to take some extra time uh, above our normal uh, services to be able to have this, uh, this focus for our men. And uh, I want to thank Pastor Garen and Pastor King and uh, everyone involved that was uh, helping us with the technology. I, I enjoy doing things live, and uh, it, it has some really good sermon illustration opportunities and uh, really proves the point. Uh, but I'm, I'm so thankful for uh, the preaching of the Word of God and uh, just the powerful uh, scripture passages that were shared today that are very important for us as, as godly men. And so I'm thankful for Pastor King and Pastor Garen and all of their preparation and uh, all those who are involved, family members and staff members who are helping uh, make this uh, a part of our ministry opportunity today. I wanted to just share with you from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, if you would please turn uh, to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. I wanted to share, we've looked at the character of godly men. We've looked at the heart of godly men. And I just want to take a few minutes to, to look at the home of godly men, to look at the focus, you could say the focus of godly men at our real home. I want us to talk about heaven about what is, what is heaven like? We've been bombarded with questions of the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, what does this virus do? All types of questions. Uh, how do you get this virus? 
Uh, who does who does it affect? How is it transmitted? Um, what is it like to have it once you catch the virus? How many people are infected today in our province? Uh, how many are infected up to date? How many uh, actual cases are still in the hospital? How many are in ICU? Uh, how many are around the world? How many deaths in our province? What about in Canada? What about in North America? What about around the world? There's maps that you can search out to get answers to your question. Strangely enough, in some countries, they're just not reporting. So there's uh, it, there doesn't seem to be as many. But all of these questions, and I just want to take our questions uh, to focus on heaven. I want us to focus on the questions of another topic on heaven. What is heaven like? Who is there? How do you get there? What is it like to be there? Once you get there, what are you going to do? I want us to just kind of focus on heaven. What is heaven like? And of course, to, to answer that question, what is heaven like? You, we have to go to the Bible, not people's experiences. Because we found out from the Bible, God's holy word, which is our authority for truth and for knowing God. God has revealed to him, us, revealed to us himself in the scriptures. And so we want to start just thinking about the book of Genesis. It was the first book in the Bible where we found out about how mankind got here. How did the earth get here? Through creation. It talks about how God made mankind in the book of Genesis and gave him the ability to have relationships, giving to man an eternal soul and the ability to enjoy the glory and the love of God. In Genesis, we find how mankind sinned in the Garden of Eden and allowed sin into the world. Romans 5.12 reminds us about the book of Genesis. The reason things went so bad on our planet and the curse here is because one man sinned and sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death is passed upon all men for that all have sinned. In the book of Genesis, we learn that man did this in spite of the warnings of God of the punishment of sin. Because of man's sin, the human race was cursed to be separated from God, and the curse on earth now allows thorns and pain, suffering, viruses like COVID-19, and even bodily death. These are all as a result of the punishments of sin, and mankind did it in spite of God's warning. Luke of Genesis also shares with us how that God made hell for the devil and his angels. The book of Matthew, Jesus speaks about this, that at this time of the fall that God made hell for the devil and his angels, and of course, sinful mankind, because we have put ourselves in alignment with the devil by our sinful choice and by birth of that sin nature being passed down since the book of Genesis. But thankfully, the rest of the Old Testament is the true story of the telling of the coming hope of a redeemer who would come to rescue sinful mankind from punishment and from the consequences of sin. The Messiah, a Christ, would come to cleanse and the stain of humanity's heart and to rescue the ruined planet and restore the ability to enjoy God's creation and God's perfect love and that relationship with him. The Old Testament, we move into the New Testament, the true account of the coming of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Matthew through John, what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he was born of a virgin, with the purpose of dying for the sins of mankind and paying the price for our sins as our substitute. The rest of the New Testament explains the joy of forgiveness of sins by coming to God by faith and accepting the free gift of eternal life. A repentant, sorrowful sinner can trust in the finished work of the resurrected Jesus Christ and call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. The book of Romans tells us that at the time of salvation, the sinner's name is written in heaven, as Jesus spoke in the book of Luke and other passages, that Jesus is in heaven right now, the book of Hebrews talks about, making a home for a believer. John 14 also gives us information in that regard. But then we come to the book of Revelation. It tells us the end of God's programs in the last days. What is going to happen in the last days of God's program? That there will be a rapture of the church. There will be a seven-year horrible tribulation on this earth of God's wrath. Then his second coming, Jesus will come to the earth. He will set up kingdom for a thousand years on this earth. And the Bible says that God will renovate the heavens and the earth, and we will go into eternity future in the new heaven and the new earth. And that's what I want to focus on for the next few minutes that we have together. In Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And if you have a pen... I'd like for you to underline some things about that are going to be in eternity future. 
We talk about going to heaven. Uh, the Bible does teach that when a believer dies in this life, that to be absent from the body is present with the Lord, that we go to be in heaven proper around with the throne room of God and in heaven. But we, after all of God's end time programs, we will end up with a new heaven and a new earth. That's where we'll spend eternity. And I just want to talk about that new heaven and the new earth. What will it be like to be forever with God? What will it be like there in this place called heaven? And there, are, there are some times when you try and describe something, some places you've never been before. And sometimes when you think about heaven, there are scenes you think about of, of angels with humans with wings on their back, floating on a cloud, strumming a harp just forever and ever and ever, just floating around up in space, bumping into other clouds and other saints and St. Peter's at the gate and all these other strange things that, that are not true. But the Bible is where we find the truth about what is it like to be go to heaven. You talk about kids. Some kids are, are not excited about going back to school. They've always talked about, oh, I don't want summer to end. I don't want Christmas break to end. I want to, want to go back to school. And now some children would rather be at school. Some parents are praying that the schools will actually open up sometime. But, but when, you've, when you haven't been to a place, you, it's hard to get excited about going there. But I, I want us to show you just two things about heaven, and then we're going to look at something else. I want us to look about heaven. It's eternity, future heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. This is what we're going to be doing forever. And I think our excitement and intensity will grow at looking forward to what's going God has and prepared for us when we look at what the text says of some things that are in heaven that you and I are familiar with. There are some things that are going to ring true. You're going to say, hey, I know what that is, and I've seen that before. And it's going to be strangely familiar. There's going to be some things that are going to be missing in the new heaven and the new earth as well. First, I want us to look at the things that seem familiar. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse number one. The Bible says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Right from the get-go, I noticed that there's a new heaven and a new earth. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen stars? You ever seen clouds in an atmosphere? You ever see planets? You ever see, a, ever see those types of things? What about earth? You walk around with dirt, there's grass, there's plants, there's flowers. Guess what? That's what you're going to be in heaven, in the new heaven and new earth. Those things are familiar. You know what those are. You know what an earth is. You've lived on it your whole life. And guess what? In eternity future, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The word for new here, it's almost as if it's renovated. So it's familiar. It's not going to be some strange orb. We're not going to spend eternity on Pluto or Saturn or Uranus and things, planets we've never been to before. It's going to be Earth. It's going to be renovated in a new, wonderful way. Not only a new heaven, a new Earth. Verse number two says, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Let me ask you a question. You ever been to a city? Have you been to Halifax? You, you, you come over the hill, you see the citadel, and then you could look down uh, past Queen Street and, and Barrington down into the water there, into the, into the harbor. You, you ever been to Ottawa? Have you ever been able to see the Parliament Building? Have you ever gone in the wintertime when you actually skate the Oval? You've been to a city before? You've been to Quebec City where you have the old city down below and you had the, the trolley that you could take up or you could take the stairs or, or take the streets along the side and then go up to the, to the upper city that's up there. And then you have downtown Quebec City. What about Montreal? You ever been to a city? Pastor King mentioned Washington, D.C. You ever been to a city? Guess what? There's going to be a city in the new heaven and the new earth. You can be familiar with that. You know, there's good news. Not only is there going to be a city, there must be a country. Everything's not a city. Jerusalem's going to be a city, that's for sure. But there's going to be country too. So in the new heaven and new earth, you can look forward to it as a child of God. That it's going to be earth, there's going to be sky, and there's going to be a planet, and there's actually going to be a city. You're familiar with that. You know what's there. Look at verse number three. It says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God. Wait a minute. You said there, you heard a great voice? Can I just share with you? The Bible says there's going to be voices in heaven. You're going to talk. You're going to communicate. You're going to use words. It's not going to be some Morse code. We're not going to be silent with our vocal cords not working and go by sign language or flashing lights. We're not going to have to hold, uh, we're not going to have to text each other. We're going to be able to talk. 
You're going to be able to hear people's voices. Some of the things with the pandemic that's so frustrating is that's all we're able to hear with all of the Zoom and the FaceTime and all of these things and Messenger. Maybe you can hear some voices of your loved ones, but you can't see them. But aren't you thankful that in the new heaven and new earth, you're going to communicate and God's going to communicate to you. People are going to communicate to each other with language and you're going to understand. So it's going to be familiar. You've talked before. You're going to be able to talk in heaven. Not only about a voice and communication, verse number three says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. What a wonderful thing. Did you ever have a roommate? Did you have to uh, have a, a brother or sister that you shared a room with? You live with a parent. Maybe you live with both parents. Maybe you live with your grandparents for a while. Maybe you had a single parent home. Maybe you were adopted and people loved you enough to, to bring you into their home. Either way, you lived with people. Guess what? In the new heaven and the new earth, God is going to live with us. There, there's, a, there's relationships in the new heaven and the new earth. Not only does it say God is going to live with them, it says in verse number three, it says God will, uh, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. He says, and they shall be his people, and that's in the plural. So peoples is bad English, but in the, in the original, it has the idea of God. It says, uh, they shall be his peoples. Did you ever have a group that you like to hang around? I know right now it's so hard. In New Brunswick, there's new regulations. You can have a bubble. So there's one of the family that you can contact with, and you don't have to social distance from anymore. Just one, one other family. This is the new regulations in New Brunswick. Who knows? If there's three new cases, we're going to have to go back to code red, uh, and we're going to have to go back to more stringent policies. But it's interesting. Your, your bubble, you know, one family has to agree, and the other family has to agree that you're going to be in this. But, but you can't have your, your bigger bubble. Not yet. Not, a, not as long as we're in code yet, uh, orange, I think it is. Uh, but do but you, you like to golf? Do you have golfing buddies? You walk on the golf course, you go into the club, and there's some guys getting their golf clubs out, and there's some guys over there renting a cart, and there's some guys over there getting out a tee, and, and uh, they're putting their golf shoes on. You say, these are my people. They're golf people. What about hunting? We were talking uh, earlier about hunting. Pastor Garen was mentioning that. You ever have a group of friends where you go out and you go goose hunting or, or uh, maybe deer hunting, or maybe you go fishing with, and you say, no, these are my people. You know, these are hunting people. I know there was a church in the Maritimes at Fundamental Baptist Church in St. John that had a, uh, had a hunting uh, um, uh, luncheon and, and, and outreach at their church. And uh, it was a wonderful time. And they get these guys looking around and they see all of these booths up with, with uh, hunting bear and, and hunting deer and, and hunting um, and fishing. And they see all of the, and they say, you know what, guys, these are my people. This is great. This is my group. You know that when you get to heaven, it's going to feel like your group. God looks at sinners that have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've been bought by the blood of Christ. They've trusted him by faith. And God shows up in the new heaven and new earth that everybody is so excited to see each other and to see God because God says, these are my people. I've rescued them. They've trusted me and I've saved them. And I've brought them now into the new heaven and the new earth. It's going to feel like home, friends, when you get to the new heaven and the new earth. Not only that, it's very interesting. It says in verse number four, and it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, I know this may seem a little strange to you, but my mind works in detail, and the scriptures give us detail. Did you know you're going to have eyes in heaven? Honestly. And apparently, those eyes are still going to have tear ducts. And if you've got tear ducts, you're going to have to blink because it spreads the moisture in the eye. Do you know that you're going to have eyes in heaven? Now, right now, when you go out in public, you're not supposed to touch your face. You're not supposed to. I don't know about you, but when I go to the grocery store, everything starts to itch. My nose starts to itch and my eyes starts to itch and I get an itch in my ear because when I have allergies and I get this time of year, when I'm around things I'm allergic to, my, the hairs in my ears stand up and it makes my ears itch. And you're not supposed to touch your face. You know, you're going to have a face in heaven and you're going to have eyes and you're going to blink. Do you blink here on earth? Do you look at different things? Guess what? You're going to have eyes in heaven. It's going to be, you're going to be, you're already practicing using your eyes now. You're going to have them for eternity in your, your glorified body. Heaven is going to be so familiar in one sense. But not only does it talk about eyes, it says in verse number five, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Now think about that. God is sitting down. You know, the Bible speaks about 
us ruling and reigning with Christ during the millennial kingdom and then on into forever. Do you know that we're going to be able to sit down in heaven? You know how to do that. Listen, if you think that heaven is just floating around in a cloud strumming a harp, I don't know about you, but I can't play a harp. We have a lady in our church that plays a harp, and it sounds so wonderful, but I can't play a harp. I don't know about you, but I can't float around on a cloud. I don't have a clue what that's like, but I do know what it means to stand up, to walk around the room, and to sit down. You can even have a favorite chair. You know that in heaven, you're going to be able to sit down and stand up and walk around. You may even have a favorite chair. It's so familiar. You've done this before. Heaven is a wonderful place to look forward to. There's so many familiar things about heaven, and it's very interesting to see with God's picture here. Look at verse number six of, Re of Revelation 21. As then he said unto me, it is done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. I want you to notice a couple of things. There's water in heaven. Now, it's the water of life. This is good stuff. Now, I don't know what you like to drink. I don't know if your favorite thing is water with lemon in it or water with, with um, citrus in it or lime. You like to put a little bit of lime in it. Maybe you're a Kool-Aid person or maybe you're a coffee person. I don't know if you like dark roast or if you like that hazelnut. Uh, uh, I don't know if you like lattes. I don't know if you like um, espressos. Do you like tea, chai tea, uh, green tea? Uh, I don't know. Do you like Coke? Do you like Pepsi? you like Dr. Pepper? You realize when you get to heaven that you're going to have water of life. It's going to be any carbonated beverage you've ever had. You're going to be able to feel it go down. You know, on a hot day, you drink that cup of water and you can just feel it go all the way down. You're going to have taste buds in heaven. You're going to be able to drink. You're going to be able to have levels of pleasure. Do you understand that? You're going to have your heavenly glorified body just like Jesus did forevermore. Do you know that Jesus glorified body that he ate fish? Do you know that Jesus sat down and he broke bread with the disciples? Do you understand that? Do you know that you're going to have an appetite in heaven? You're going to be, it's going to need quenching. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to hurt. Your tummy's never going to hurt. But it's just this level of perfectness. You're not hurting. But all of a sudden, you're going to drink this water of life, and your pleasure level is going to go up. You're going to feel it go down, and your pleasure level is going up. You say, Pastor Cochran, how does that work? How does it work that in a, in a heavenly place where there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no sorrow, there's no crying, I have my perfect heavenly body that doesn't experience pain, but somehow there's a, pay, there's a pleasure threshold level that can go up. And you're going to just be enjoying the day. And since you know what, I want to drink the water of life. And Jesus says, you come, you come on back. This is all you can eat, drink buffet. It's not a one-time thing. You go get your Tim Hortons and then you're done. No, this is a, uh, this isn't a roll up the rim. Oh, you come back later. This is a you win every time. And you come back as much as you want. Uh, we went on vacation a few years ago with our kids. We went to this huge buffet. You could make your own ice cream. You could have your own pop. You could make your own coffee. You could, there was a, a, a meat bar over here. There was a salad bar over here. There was a vegetable bar over here. And you could just keep going back and back and back. Heaven's going to be like that. You can drink the water of life freely. You see, it's more familiar to you than you realize. It says there's going to be water, there's going to be thirst, and it's going to be able to be quenched. In verse number seven, it says, I will be his God and he will be my son. Do you have family on this earth? I hope that you have a church family that you're connecting to during this time. The family of God. That you trust Christ as your personal savior and you become a, a, a child of God by faith that he adopts you into his family. He puts his spirit in your heart, and the Holy Spirit said, yes, cry, Abba, Father. Now, I don't know what your relationship was like, was like with your father, but part of that, if it's been good, was just to taste. Maybe it was a grandfather you had such a good relationship with. Maybe when you got saved, you came into the church, there was a godly man in the church that just really befriended you and discipled you and became like a father figure to you or like a, a, a brother in Christ. You know, there's going to be relationships in heaven. You're going to get to heaven, and it's not going to feel strange because Gabriel's flying around and Michael's flying around with messages and defending and, and honor guard and all these beautiful things in eternity future, but it's going to seem like home. It's going to seem so familiar. In verse number 10, it's very interesting. The Bible says that there was a great mountain. There's going to be mountains in the new heaven and new earth. Have you ever seen a mountain? We're on Lutz Mountain here, and people laugh who, when we call this a mountain when they have been to the Rockies in western Canada. 
but there's going to be a great mountain in the new heaven and the new earth. It could be, you know how, you know how impressed, I one pastor made a comment, you know how easily we are impressed with, with, with this planet? I mean, you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Did you ever want to go? Now, the Grand Canyon is just a big ditch. You know how many people and tourist people actually go to get pictures with themselves and selfies at the big ditch? Now, of course, there's warning signs that when you're stepping back to do your selfie, you don't go back too far. But it's just a huge ditch. It's, it's kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of this, this river that the great deluge of the flood came through and cut that, that, those, those chasms out. It's just a big ditch. And we're like, wow. Can you imagine what the mountains are like in the new heaven and the new earth? It's a great high mountain. It's beautiful. It's going to be amazing. You know what mountains look like. There's going to be mountains in the new heaven and the new earth. It says there's a holy Jerusalem. Verse number 10. Have you ever heard the word Jerusalem before? Now, you may not have ever heard the word of Kalamazoo. My wife was born in Kalamazoo. She grew up in Kalamazoo. Some of you never heard of Kalamazoo, Michigan. I went to school in Warm Springs. You ever heard of Warm Springs? That's okay. But have you heard of Jerusalem? If you trusted Christ as your Savior and been studying the Bible very long, you've heard Jerusalem almost a couple times a week sometimes. You've studied the Bible. You've been in Sunday school. That's where Jesus walked. That's outside the city where he was crucified. That's the place where he rose from the dead. That's where David was king. That's where Solomon was king. Oh, when you go to the new heaven and the new earth, there's going to be a city that you're going to want to go see. It's going to be a wonderful place. You said, I thought it was new. It is. It's renovated, but it's still Zion. It's still going to be a hill. There's still going to be a Mount of Olives. There's still going to be Jerusalem. It's going to be a city. It's going to be rather large. It's interesting about this city. It says it's going to have walls around it. Have you ever seen a wall? If you go up to Baktush, you can see in the, the Irving Park there that they brought over, I believe it was oh, a stone wall builders from Scotland to build this little stone wall. It's real pretty. And all these stones perfectly fit together. Have you seen a big wall, like a really big wall, like the Great Wall to China Wall? This wall in heaven is going to be about eight stories high, I believe. But it's still a wall. You've seen a wall. You know what walls look like. It's going to have gates, the Bible says. There's going to be 12 gates. Have you ever seen a gate? It's made of pearl. It's not made of lava from mercury. The Bible says they're gates of pearl. You know what a pearl is. You see, heaven's not as strange and ethereal as you, you think it is. We've been given hints of it, and God is going to take Little things of this planet that we know about, he's going to perfect it, and it's going to show up again in the new heaven and the new earth. Heaven is going to be so wonderful. There's so many things that are here that, that you can actually measure this city. There's gold and glass. You know what glass looks like. You know what gold. There are going to be streets there. You ever seen a street? It's interesting. In verse number 24, I want to show you specifically. It says, and the nations of them that were saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring forth glory and honor into it. I want you to notice two things about this verse in the new heaven and the new earth. There are going to be nations there. You ever think about that? I think there's going to be a Canada in the new heaven and the new earth. I really do. I think there's going to be Egypt in the new heaven and the new earth. I think there's going to be a United States. I think there's going to be a China. There's going to be a Brazil and a Romania. There's going to be nations in the new heaven and the new earth. You know what nations are. They're geographical places on the planet. But the interesting thing is, is that in eternity future, it's all of the people that have ever placed their faith in God for salvation. Remember God's people? That's who's going to be there in these nations in, in, in eternity future. It talks about kings. There's going to be prime ministers. There's going to be uh, um, presidents, possibly, but there's going to be kings. There may be different cabinets. There's going to be kingdoms. There's going to be perfect governments because everybody that goes into, into heaven, new heaven and new earth in eternity future is a believer. They've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. They've placed their faith in God for forgiveness of sins. It's amazing. It says here that they bring these kings, these nations, they walk and they bring their glory and honor to Jerusalem. Can you think about that? What, does different, what do different nations around the world have as their glory and honor? You think in Canada, what, what do we like to produce? Well, right now we're producing maple syrup. Some people produce lobster. Is it possible that in the future coming kingdoms, there will actually be nations on this earth that will bring from Canada 
maple syrup to Jerusalem. Wouldn't that be amazing? I wish I had the time to speak of many other things of the gates that are never shut. There's a river, a river of water of life. There are trees, the tree of life. Do you realize that the tree is much like the Trans Canada, where it has in the middle section of the, sit, of the, of the uh, streets of gold, in the middle section there are trees that are called the tree of life, and on either side of the river there are trees. These are familiar things. You know what a street is. You know what trees are. It says they bear fruit in their months. You said, I, th I thought there was no more time. Well, that's true. There'll be no end of time, but there'll be seasons still. Do you know what fall is? You know what spring is? We know what winter is, but it's not going to hurt anymore. We know what summer is, but there won't have to be any deserts anymore. Those are the things that are actually in heaven. There are a lot of things that are not going to be in heaven. There's going to be no more sea. Well, that'll make lots of land mass so more people can fit. There's going to be no more death, sorrow, crying. There'll be no need of the sun, no more night, no thing that defiles, no abomination, no lies. There's no curse. There's no light. There's no sun. There's no need of the moon because God is the light. But you know what else there will not be in heaven? There will not be sinners. Revelation chapter 21, verse number eight says, the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What is not going to be in heaven in eternity future are sinners who never accepted Jesus Christ as their savior, who never trusted God's word by faith in repentance. If I were to describe hell to you, friend, it would be the opposite of heaven. All of the wonderful things I've described to you are what's going to happen in eternity future with heaven. Do you know that the Bible says in Matthew chapter 8 that, the, that hell is no, has no light, it's outer darkness? Do you know that Luke chapter 13 says that hell is a lonely place where you are outcast and have that feeling of weeping and gnashing of teeth forever? You know, the Bible says that hell is not a place of pleasure, but of punishment. Matthew chapter 25, they go away into everlasting punishment. You know, the Hebrews 6, the Bible says that there is eternal no hope because it's everlasting judgment. You know, the Bible says that there is fire forever where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9. You know that there's torment there in Luke chapter 16. There's unquenchable thirst, Luke 16. There's torment in Luke 16, 25. There's a memory of regret, of all of the neglect of truth and the rejection of truth, Luke chapter 16, verse 28. Revelation 14, 11 says there's no rest in hell, day or night. Revelation 21, 8 says it's a lake. Oh, there's a river in heaven. That's the water of life. But in hell, there is a lake, friend, but it's a lake of fire. It's the opposite of heaven. Revelation 9, number 16, Ezekiel talk about it's a bottomless pit. There's no earth to put your feet on in hell. It's just the opposite. It's a bottomless pit. Revelation 9 and chapter 1, the Bible says that there are gates. There are gates. Jesus has the keys. And the saddest thing of all, well, Romans, Revelation chapter 9 says that there is a smell of smoke that burns like a furnace. That smell of sulfur and horrid will go in your nose the rest of your life for all eternity, forever and ever. See, hell is the opposite of heaven. It's a very sad thing. The worst thing about hell is, is that there will be no God. There'll be no Jesus there. Can I just take a moment in closing? We've looked at what is heaven like and what is hell like. And I just, just want to ask you, answer a question for you. What do I have to do to go to heaven? And what do I have to do to go to hell? Do you know what you have to do to go to hell is absolutely nothing else? See, because the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, that he that believeth not is condemned already. Do you know that you were born a sinner, separated from God? See, if you just ignore God's for, uh, gift of eternal life and you ignore your sinful state and you ignore the holiness of God, you are already on your way to a Christless eternity. But friend, 
That's the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus has paid the penalty of your sins. And you may not be saved yet, but you can be. You can call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You can trust Christ as your Savior. So, as I come to a close, if, if, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, you've never been sorry for your sins, you've never done business with God, you haven't paid attention to what the Bible says about holiness and heaven and hell, it's just been a joke to you. But as the Spirit of God convicts you in your heart, you realize that the Bible's true. There is a heaven and there is a hell. But Jesus Christ died on the cross and stood in your place and paid the penalty. It's already been paid. If you will repent and be sorry for your sins and call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved. Christians, can I just encourage us today with heaven? It seems so familiar. The most wonderful thing about heaven is Jesus Christ, God himself. We're going to be his people. It's so wonderful. There's so many familiar things that are there. But I've never seen Jesus with my eyes. I've seen him with my heart by faith but we're going to get to see him. All of these wonderful things are just extra perks. And much like when I was a boy, I would go to my nanny's house. And I used to love to go to my nanny's house. She would cook these great meals and, and have great vegetables out of her garden. And we would play in the sandbox and we'd go fishing down in her pond. And, and uh, we would have such a great time. But the older I got, the more I thought less about the perks and more about my nanny and my papa. Christian, as you study God's word, heaven looks like an exciting place. And it sounds real familiar, but it's so different. There'll be no sin, and it'll be wonderful. And the more you mature, the more you think about the God of heaven and Jesus Christ of heaven than the actual place. It's a real place, friend. It's a wonderful place. So this COVID-19 pandemic is going to pass. Are you focusing on the godly character that Brother Tim Guerin talked about? Are you focused on that, that godly heart that Pastor King talked about? Are you ready to think soberly, to look forward to the future, to our real home in heaven? It feels strange down here, but when you get to heaven, it's not going to feel strange. It's going to feel like home if you've trusted Christ as your Savior. I hope that this conference has been an encouragement to you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the preaching we've heard today. I pray that you would bless our men, that they would be encouraged. And if there's any who've never trusted Christ as their Savior, that they would get on their knees and call upon the Lord to be their personal Savior today. I pray for Christian men who know that they're your people. They've called upon you to be saved by faith. Encourage our men today that they would be men who are under the work of your Spirit to produce godly character, men who are under the work of your Spirit to work on our hearts that we would not have idols and we would not give way to lusts, but we would follow the work of your spirit. Help us to look like Jesus. And in the meantime, would we look forward to our home in heaven one day? What a wonderful place it is. May we share the good news so that those who are not headed there yet can join us on the way. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our conference, our Men's Heart Conference in 2020 at the Grace Baptist Church. God bless you and you are dismissed. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your defender is he who is always a saint. Mount up with wings as he Ascending, victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong.
will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare.